Welcome, this is Ed in San Diego and it's March 27th. And this program, this telecast is uh, global and includes people from many locations, but everyone has a really keen interest on the topic that has been developed primarily by my co-host and partner, Dr. Lynn Schmidt. Lynn, welcome. Please enunciate the topic from your view. Yeah, absolutely. So my book, um, Anti-Sexist, I wrote it because as I was doing research on sexism, I found that there are different, obviously different topics and people tend to hone in on those. I couldn't find one comprehensive guide on sexism for the lay person. And so I put it together and it focuses on the four aspects of sexism, which are microaggression, discrimination, harassment, and violence. And so this topic is really to take a look at where do women stand today? What's been happening? What's in the news? What are the statistics? But then to look to all of you with all of your expertise in this area, coming from different backgrounds, different, different focus areas, what are your ideas? What are your, your solutions? What has worked and what, what hasn't worked? And what do women should women do? And what should men do um, to really change the trajectory of these statistics because they, they aren't good? And, and I think, Ed, I don't know if you want me to talk about those yet or if you just want to do some quick introductions and then come back to me and I'll kind of do a setup with the stats and some things. Yeah, yeah we will do that. We will be joined by several people uh, in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes, and then some others will come in during the progress and some others will need to leave. So everyone, please use the chat to send a quick message to each other, to everybody, including your website or phone or date of birth, if you want, whatever. And uh, my, mine is June 16th and uh, we'll leave the year out. <laughs> so I'm in San Diego and with us now from Helsinki is Michael Gates. Welcome, Michael Gates. Say a quick hi, please. Hi. Hi, everyone. I was just writing hi in the chat, but uh, I'll say it instead. So uh, I'm based in uh, Helsinki, so that's where I'm calling from today. Yeah, well, thank you so much for doing this. I know you're really busy at this time of year. Michael Gates is a professor at Oxford University and also uh, has an extremely successful consulting business, cross-cultural training. Michael, very quickly, just as we get going here, just as a, as a pricey of what you're gonna be talking about later, your cross-cultural uh, enterprise over the years, many years, but particularly now, what is this, how does this relate in your view to the existential battle between men and women? I think it relates a lot because when we're talking about culture, there are many different layers. Of course, you know, the national, the regional, um, in the U UK where I'm from, there's the class uh, issue. And then obviously gender uh, is one of the big uh, the things. And I think uh, if you talk about gender, what are, the, what are the differences between different cultures and how gender is viewed? Um, so, you know, I'm based in Finland. Uh, we were the first country to give women both the vote and stand for office in, I think, 1906. Um, so it's quite a privileged uh, place to work uh, as regards equality. But there are many other cultures I work with where things are rather different. Great. Also with us from London area is Robert Baker. Welcome, Mr. Baker. Hi, Edwin. How are, uh, and everyone, how are we all doing? Yeah, just great. Welcome. We're just getting going here. Um, oh, okay. So, so, Mr. Baker, I want you to meet Dr. Lynn Schmidt, who's my co-host and partner in this. Lynn, Mr. Baker. Hi, Bob. How you doing? <laughs> Hi, Lynn. I'm fine, thank you. It's lovely to connect with you this way, uh, having had so much interaction on LinkedIn and other great sources like that. So it's good to be part of this. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, you bet. Now, Mr. Baker, please uh, quickly do a 30-second self-intro. So uh, as we go around the the table here that everyone gets to understand why and who okay so yeah um well i i spent 40 years working at mercer the global hr consulting firm and then set up my own business uh back in january 2020 to basically focus on diversity equity and inclusion uh so i do a lot of work with companies um helping their male executives 
understand why, for example, diversity and inclusion is a good idea, and, and in particular, gender balance and gender equality. Um, I've always been passionate about this uh, area. I've been on the board of various women's networks and still am today. Uh, I'm on the board of European Women on Boards, which is trying to promote uh, the 40% uh, women on boards in Europe, for example. So, uh, yeah, it's a topic I'm very passionate about and uh, very active in that field and delighted to be part of this. So thank you. Oh, that's great. We're going to hear a lot from you. And from uh, Rotterdam, Tineke, welcome again. Hi. It's it, it seems that I'm jumping in, but I thought it just started. Oh, it just did, but we're really fast talkers. So <laughs> we we can't wait. We have to begin. So so <laughs> so please do a 30-second quick intro so everyone gets to know you and share information okay. in the chat. Well, I resonate, Robert, with uh, what you do. I also uh, I am transitioning from a business coach to uh, to uh, female uh, owners to uh, <clears throat> creating awareness with uh, male executives on that the gender gap is not only about equal rights for women, but is about a whole lot more. Um, and I am growing into that uh, phase. My website is ready, uh, and I'm now um, yeah starting to uh, network. And I have a lot of uh, Robert, so I think we should connect. I have a lot of expertise on women and how women function. What is the masculine? What is the feminine? Um, yeah. So and how they can collaborate to strong force together. Yeah, it's fascinating. Wonderful. And uh, please uh, allow me to introduce Dr. Natalie Forrest, who's with us in Hamburg. Uh, Natalie and I first met when she was based in the Baltimore, Washington area, and uh, back in the good old days when I produced live meetings, she spoke at several. Dr. Natalie, what do you think of all this masculine feminine thing? Well, first of all, thank you, Edwin, and it's so nice to see everybody again. What do I think of masculine feminine? Well, I think we all have it all, and we can pick and choose, and for the last a hundred years, the masculine seem to have been superimposed a little bit on life in general. I do see, however, that currently the feminine side is gaining a lot more ground. Whether we talk about um, heart and head connection, whether we talk about bringing a little bit more emotions into what we're doing and seeing the successes of that, or just the ability to actually discuss these various issues together. So I think it's a fascinating time and uh, working with women at a crossroads and doctors, this is perfect because we all need to come together and really use all aspects of ourselves, feminine, masculine, heart, head, everything together. And I think that's what we see here in this group. Okay, we'll be right back to you, uh, Annette Dernick. Thanks so much for all your cheery uh, support. And I love what you're doing with the German Speakers Association. Why don't you explain what that is? Yeah, the German Speakers Association. Yes, I also love to be with them, to be a speaker. And my topic is love and peace in companies. And so it's um, about what um, Natalie already mentioned. It's um, to work together in um, a more peaceful and appreciative way. And uh, Natalie, when I've been listening to you, I thought, oh, yeah, that's really what we can also see in um, cultural dimensions, um, which um, is called um, uh, power distance, that in my opinion, it's now becoming um, lower. Um, so that people are, do not um, have this big differences, let's say, between bosses and um, employees. And um, this for me is um, also kind of the feminine way. And I experience this not only with women, but also with very many men um, in my business surroundings. Thank you so much. Annalisa, thanks so much for being, I uh, love your hat. <laughs> thanks, Ed. <laughs> yeah, so great you're, to be here you, again. You are um, helping a lot of people and you're also, you're also prepping, preparing for the launch of your own programs, right? Yeah. Oh, actually, um, we're recording episode three this week, so we've got two online already. 
So, uh, so yeah, the show of values is on YouTube and all the usual podcasts as well. So, um, so yes, it's uh, it's all about celebrating the values we live and the value we give, and uh, and I think that extends as well to the conversation about uh, men and women um, uh, in in all areas of life. So if, uh, if we can focus on celebrating what we bring to the world and, the com and, uh, and to the conversation, instead of just looking at our gender, total accident of birth, whether we're born a man or a woman, and how crazy is it in 2023 that we are still having to have this conversation. I find it uh, un unbelievable, really, um, that we still are. And it, uh, yeah, we need to change things. So I applaud Lynn Schmidt and everything that she's doing. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Yeah, and I look forward to being a guest on your show in April, April 17th. Yes, right? can't wait, Ed. Yeah, me too. Let's say hi to Yvonne. Why? Hi. You're so, on so, uh, so, sorry, I'm late. I was at another meeting. Yeah, no problem. So Yvonne is uh, uh, an author, uh, a great book called uh, Whose Career Is It? Yours, Mine, or Ours? And she has years of experience as a coach and manager of the uh, World Bank Family Network. Yvonne, did I get that right? Yes, you did. Okay, great. And she's coming to us from Washington. So in dealing with um, people in banking around the world, these are pretty high powered people. So is there a big debate? Are, are women and men in the bank, are they allies? I, I, I think it depends on, 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 on who, I, I think to, to, to say everyone's an ally is too broad. And to say everyone who's not an ally is also too broad. I think it's uh, some and some. Um, you know, I think we have a lot of people from many different cultures. And so I think when it comes to, to, to women, a lot of uh, people are affected by genderized expectations of, of, of who they think women are and what they can and cannot do. But, you know, recently with the International a women's month we had a lovely example and of this east asian woman she she wrote and shared how one of her colleagues was an ally because she's she's asian she's very small and petite and they were on a, a project and the client country kept on referring to her as the little girl you know the little girl on the team and her colleague stepped in and said she is the senior urban specialist. She's not a little girl. And so, you know, there are examples where people step in and there are examples where people perpetuate the little girl syndrome, you know? So I think it's, I mean, it's got to, <laughs> to be that because we're still 300 years behind. If we're that far forward, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing today. Isn't that interesting? I want to introduce a good friend, uh, and also a member of the Global Press Club, as you are, Gary Sanger. He's a preeminent pre <coughs> uh, retained executive search guy. He's a leader uh, and the president of his own company, a very successful uh, entrepreneur. I've done enough. You take over, Gary. A pleasure to be here. <laughs> I'm in Los Angeles. I'm a retained headhunter. And so my business gets involved with each business on every search. That search for senior management and executives, that company makes the rules. They define what's important to them. And if they define that it's important to them to make their uh, senior management or executive team more diverse, and whether that's by age or by male or female or by whatever criteria, you know, they're going to choose. And it's only my opinion that the more diverse you are, depending on the client base, depending on the customers, depending on your staff, depending on your community, 
the better you're going to be. And Yvonne, your comment about stepping in, you know, I think we have um, bullies everywhere. And when you're in a meeting and you're in a meeting and you're celebrating something, you're bringing up a point and somebody has the audacity to call somebody a little girl or a little boy or whatever the vernacular is, I think those of us that are sitting right next to them or across the room, we got to throw something at them. We got to make this stop and we have to, uh, you know, have the equality of what the idea is and what the suggestion is, not whether that person's a little boy or a little girl. I, uh, uh, I'm a farm boy from Idaho. And so, uh, you know, I used to take matters in my own hands when stuff like that happened. Thank goodness I've outgrown that. But uh, I think we all are in this to, uh, you know, to make it better. Uh, Robert Baker, your years uh, of executive uh, level within Mercer has brought you in touch with the world's largest companies, I'm sure. And now you're dealing in an entrepreneurial way uh, with uh, basically startups, right? Yeah, well, um, I'm working for clients that are big global companies. So those of you who follow my on LinkedIn post will know that I was in uh, Paris for International Women's Day with NG, uh, which is one of the world's largest global energy companies. So I do work with uh, large global companies, but I'm also very interested in startup, the startup world and the innovation and um, the excitement, the buzz that comes from that. So I'm involved as a non-exec director in two startups. One is a gender pay gap company called Spectral, and the other is a talent development platform using AI to help kind of suggest leadership experiences that people might need to develop their careers. So, um, and, and I'm, in, I'm an investor in another um, woman-led um, uh, company uh, called Inpeak, which is basically a Web3 uh, development platform uh, to, to make sure that women don't get left behind in Web3. So uh, I've got quite, quite a range different, of, of different experiences, Edwin, from the big global companies through to the startups and, and everything in between. I'm so impressed with all you people wanting to be on the show. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, I want everybody to meet Sandra Corona, a good friend, and also a member of the Global Press Club now. But she and her husband have been on an expat assignment with a very large oil company we all know in Saudi Arabia for many years, but their expat assignment is concluding fairly soon. And now they're beginning to rewire themselves to come <laughs> back to Houston. And I don't know, are you going to look for a job? I am in the process. Uh, you know, asking this about what to do and how to find a job and everything else, I've realized in this time that I've been looking for a job is that it is not easy for anybody, right? And so in when I look at the posts of people that have been laid off by Google, by Meta, and all of these uh, companies, well, major that, companies, that was, it, it, exactly, thousands and thousands. What are they doing? Uh, they you know what I, I, I just think that I have, assumed is the reason why this is happening. And this is because people don't want to go back to the office, right? Mm -hmm. Think that there has been a clear, you know, declaration of people saying, I want to do this. And there is no proof, according to statistics, according to the studies out there, that people have been less productive. Actually, there's a lot of companies that are very satisfied with people working at home. But I think it's also because AI has come in so strong that companies are saying, I don't think they're taking it as a revenge. I, I hate to use that word, but it's a way to say, well, if we cannot retain our talent, we're going to invent our own talent. So they've used AI into you know, making use of that. Now, talking about the expat assignment and everything else, uh, we decided that we wanted to go back because, as I mentioned last time, we didn't want to turn hard being in a country where the, the, the ideas, the beliefs are different. They're progressing, they're growing, and that's part of culture. But 
I feel that we have reached a point where we need to go back to real life. I feel that here we're in a little bubble, right? And I'm not aware of what's going on around the world. And it's time for us to step back and say, okay, now we've accomplished what we want to accomplish as a couple. Now we need to go back home and face life. And amongst it is to find a job. And my husband, well, he's the civil engineer of PE, so I'm pretty sure he's not going to have a problem. Me as a coach, these are the struggles that we have, right? So, yeah, and I love the topic that we're going to cover today. So thank you very much for everybody. And nice to meet all of those that I haven't met before. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to speak into the uh, screen here rather than headsets. Is it clearer, better? Yes. yes. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for the guidance. And uh, we'll go from there. Back to Gary Sanger. Um, what do you think, Gary, about those massive layoffs? Is it in part because of um, the bosses taking charge and say, hey, we're not going to deal with this anymore? <laughs> See you later. You know, it seems to me that the hiring gets overdone and then the layoffs get overdone. It seems like too much on the come, too much on the expectation. And many times the employees are the ones that are suffering as you may turn down another offer or you may stay with this company, then you get laid off. The, the part that annoys me, frankly, amongst a few things, why does that CEO get, uh, you know, get profs? Why does that CEO get kudos? for taking costs out when he or she was the one that put them in there in the first place. So when you think about the big, you know, the big tranches of hires and then the big, uh, big amounts of layoffs, you know, it seems to me that the pendulum perhaps always goes too far. And those companies that stay the course, you know, and keep the, uh, you know, keep the momentum going forward without laying off, God, I really, uh, really admire them. Thank you, Gary. Let's go to Lynn, Dr. Lynn Schmidt, uh, as I mentioned, my partner and the instigator of all this. Um, can men and women be allies? I would think so, but what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I just want to lay some groundwork um, because allies in itself doesn't mean that men and women are allies. Women, an ally definition is someone who helps support someone in a marginalized group. So women can be allies to other women. A white woman can be an ally to a woman of color or a disabled woman or a, you know, um, so men also can be and need to be allies, but it, you know, both, both men and women can be allies. Um, it's, it's stepping up and stepping forward for someone in a marginalized group um, is really the definition. But I did want to read a recent headline um, just to set the stage for our discussion because all of you, are coming to the table with great ideas on how to solve these issues. But Yvonne mentioned this, and I think it's important to put it on the table. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, the UN had its meeting and looked at its most recent research. And the headline in the newspapers was this, gender equality won't be achieved for another 300 years at the current pace of progress, says the UN Secretary General. Progress won over decades is vanishing because the patriarchy is fighting back, he said. Absolutely true. I've seen it in the last eight to nine years, ever since Me Too really caught fire again. The patriarchy, and the patriarchy is a system. So both men and women can support the patriarchy, just like both men and women can be feminists and support women's rights. So I think it's important to put that on the table. That's a statistic that went up and it's a big number. Um, and so the question that I'm hearing from women and men is what, what can we do about this? Uh, a couple of other things that I wanna put on the table as we move into this discussion that as you think about your solutions and put those forward or your tips um, is that based upon my research as well for my book, Anti-Sexist and based upon UN research, um, everyone is sexist to varying degrees. Uh, their research showed that nine out of 10 people, men and women worldwide, have at least one deeply ingrained bias towards women and girls. And there were topics that, that related to when you say deeply ingrained, like 
politics, should women be in leadership, economics, should women be able to be financially um, secure in their work, healthcare, should women have have say over what happens with their own bodies. So all of those sorts of things fell into that nine out of 10. And essentially, if you look at the other ways that were sexist that came out of my research, microaggression, the things we may say and do um, about towards women and girls, the, the names we may call them, expecting them to get the coffee, uh, you know, all sorts of things. Um, run like a girl. I mean, there's things that we say and think daily, I think. And then I catch myself before it comes out of my mouth that are microaggression. And 75% of women say they experience microaggression on the job. And since we're really talking a lot about on the job, of course, it's off the job as well. Uh, and then you have discrimination. Two thirds of women say they experience descript forms of discrimination on the job. And then you have harassment which is once again, a big number on the job, which is huge off the job. And then you have violence um, and 80,000 women a year are murdered femicide because they are women. 45,000 of those are murdered by partners or ex-partners or family members. Uh, that's 200 women a day. In the US, it's five women a day are murdered simply because they're women. So if you look at that, there's all sorts of, um, implications and and as I said, people are looking uh, looking for solutions. So those are some of the key things I wanted to put in the table before we move on to this discussion to kind of lay the framework that um, the numbers aren't getting better. Uh, as the headline in the article said, um, the patriarchy is kicking in and they're fighting back and they're taking wanting to take their rights back and put women's in their place. You've seen it in the US with the loss of our, our right to women to, to own decisions about their bodies. You see it in Afghanistan with women uh, no longer being able to get in girls' education. So lots of things happening in regards to this regression, backsliding as far as women's rights. And there's certainly good things too. But we need to look, I think, at the bigger picture as you all generate your topics and ideas uh, for, for tips. And how can, how can allies help? How can those people step up and support? Uh, one of the women who wrote an essay in my book said, should we really call them allies or should we call them accomplices? Because she felt ally was too weak of a word, that an ally could simply not say anything or pull pull the person aside and say, boy, that was, really wasn't a good thing that happened. Whereas an accomplice has skin in the game. They have to step up and stand up and take risk uh, as they're supporting uh, women and women's rights. So something to think about as well, but allies have been shown to be critically important uh, to move women's rights forward. So I'll turn it back over to you, Ed. I, I want to bring in Robert Baker and then Michael Gates. Uh, so please, and, and then Yvonne, and of course, everybody. Thanks, uh, Ed, and, and, and thanks, Lynn, for that framing uh, of it. And I think it's a very interesting to uh, all of us kind of to admit that we are sexist in some way. And it was very uh, watershed for me, if you like, to get to that point where I admitted that I'm sexist, even though I'm working in the areas of diversity and inclusion and gender equality. Um, but I, you know, just out of interest, I did the Harvard implicit study about men and career and women and family and found out that I was actually biased towards uh, against, um, you know, women and career kind of thing. So, you know, it, 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 it is, uh, I think, something that really we've got to reflect on that we've all got um, this sexism within us. And it's interesting, of course, so looking in another dimension, we've all got an element of racism in this as well. So there's kind of a lot of different things that we've got to acknowledge that we we have inside us and of course the question is what can we do to become aware of those things and obviously what can we do to take action uh, on them and um so i think um that's that's pretty critical to me the, the word allyship i think is an, also an interesting one it's obviously got a lot of uh, common acceptance uh but um it, to me i think again it's got these military overtones and it also implies maybe that women kind of need that propping up and support which i don't think they necessarily need uh so what i'm talking using is partners uh, you know i mean i think accomplice is also a good one um but i think it's just simply men and women working in partnership i think um supporting each other and that's you know uh something that i i want to see um i think the other thing also we've got to have in mind is the paradox that we exist in because at the same time there's the real challenges for women there are real challenges for some men as well and people find that hard 
to have in their head at the same time. How can we have a situation where women are struggling and men are struggling? But actually, it's a paradox that we know that some men are struggling with the mental health aspects of, of, of their uh, existence and, and you know living up to these stereotypes. So it's a complex, nuanced picture. I totally agree. I think everyone is sexist. I think we've got to look at the, uh, the this kind of broader picture as well. Uh, but delighted to be, you know, having a chance to participate in this conversation uh, with you all. Well, thank you. We we want to continue this beyond today as well, and I want to invite you to consider Robert uh, speaking at my London meeting, which will be May nine. Uh, but we'll we'll get back to that later. Okay. Thank you. So um, Michael Gates. Um, Brought from a cross-cultural point of view, this business that we're talking about now, it's in every culture, isn't it? It is, uh, but I think it's more pronounced in some cultures than others. Um, yeah. I'm sure you know what yeah. sort of cultures I'm talking about. Yeah, uh, I would think India, but also some others. Yeah, um, I mean, India, um, Middle East, um, parts of Southeast Asia, um, so there is a cultural dimension to it and um, i was recently in southeast asia just before christmas uh, at an event for young <coughs> female leaders <clears throat> they were all um, up to about early 30s and um, one of the questions i asked them is you know what is most understood about your culture and you as women in that culture and um, one of the main things that they came up with was that when we're meeting internationally uh, people think we don't have anything to contribute and um, i said can you explain more and they said well <clears throat> we're not given enough space to think and i mean i think this was a sort of intersection of both being southeast asian and and female and um so i thought that was quite interesting and one of the things that I like to focus on is um, developing skills. So going beyond awareness to what skills are need, needed. And if I think about that particular group, then one of the skills they would probably need is, um, uh, you know, assertiveness training. And um, from the point of view of being able to interrupt, uh, which is not natural to that culture or in what they were saying to their gender, you know, how do you interrupt? I mean, there's a great British um, series, well, actually Irish, uh, I think it was produced in the UK, um, that I, I watched recently called Jerry, Derry Girls. And in this, uh, there's a great scene in it where there's uh, an uncle who talks nonstop. I mean, he's the most boring man in the world and he just talks and talks and talks. And this um, uh, female character, um, I think it's his, uh, his sister or his sister-in-law, just stops him and says look you need to stop talking and he looks sort of surprised for a minute and then he says oh fair enough <laughs> people need to be made aware of it on the other hand <clears throat> i mean i was talking about <clears throat> the possible assertiveness training but then you know men probably need to be trained in how to listen and not just listening to the facts but trying to work out what the emotional message is and um, you know, tr trying to find out what um, people are really trying to say. And it may involve repetition, reframing. So you feel like this. Well, I don't feel quite like that. I feel more like this and bringing that out uh, from people. And then also chairing skills. I mean, I was just in a meeting the other day and um, there was a, a, an American guy chairing it and um, there were i think three men and five women in the meeting and um, i noticed that he only asked two of the women to speak there were three women as we were approaching the last 15 minutes who'd never spoken so from a practical point of view what i what i did is i just wrote him a private chat saying please ask these three people to speak um, and then he did it so i would say that's a sort of practical type of solution. Okay, great. Well, so these, all of you are, are so eloquent uh, and I, I want to give you all due time. So please don't, don't panic. Uh, <laughs> Yvonne, why, uh, you had your hand up? 
Yes, I, I just was going to 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 say uh, uh, thank you uh, to to Robert for his honesty, and I think if uh, I think it's great if we can all acknowledge and own. I think naming and owning is a very important process of of open, opening up and w working towards uh, gender uh, equality. Uh, I think it. Uh, I tend to agree with Robert. Uh, and I think it is much more nuanced and, and, and complex than, than the, uh, you know, it's just a multifaceted problem. And I think sometimes we have played at the edges of gender equality because there is no equity. So how can we get equality? Because equity has to precede equality. And, and, and I think we need root cause analysis to look at system because you can have an allyship group for instance, doing really well in an organization. But if leadership management says, decision makers say, we still want 80% women, we're playing at the boundaries. So yes, women can speak up in the meeting because some, uh, somebody will stop the man interrupting for, for it. But mind you, other women can interrupt you too. So let's not get too polarized with, with you know, it's always men who interrupt. Women can interrupt women. Uh, but if you have performance uh, uh, guidelines and leadership decisions that are made, then no matter how many allies you have, unless you have a rebellion from the allies, it, it, it actually doesn't change anything intrinsically. And the other thing I wanted to add from the Neuro Leadership Institute, where I'm affiliated because I'm uh, trained with them as a brain-based coach. And their definition of allyship is when someone is aware of and uses their advantage position to actively support people in less advantage positions. And the amazing research statistic is that 92% of people see themselves as allies, but 29% speak up when they see bias. And I think that is, you know, and if you say that we are all biased, Lynn, as you said, we all have our biases, right? And it, th that probably explains why 92% of people would say, yes, I'm an ally. But in fact, it's only 29 who actually do something when they see something. So I, I, I thought that was, uh, it is a challenging problem, but I think we all played our part. Hopefully we'll, we'll see some traction. And in a way to be optimistic, this is the best time because there's a greater level of awareness and a greater desire across the board globally to make a difference, to, to, to change. So I think from that point, uh, it's good, but it's a complicated problem. Dr. Natalie, would you like to speak on this? Well, thank you. Um, I think it's fascinating. I love what Robert had to say. And um, you know, years ago, when I was still teaching history, one of the first things that I used to do and then applied to my coaching is walking into a room, just saying hello and everything, and then asking the group, what do you know about me now? And they would look at what I was wearing. Uh, on which finger I was having a ring, on which I wasn't having a ring. And I dressed very specifically for that occasion, usually in black and white, just because. And so they made all sorts of assumptions. And those assumptions do show our prejudices or our upbringing. For example, culturally, where you wear a ring, on the, you know, in some countries, on the right ring finger, in other countries, on the left ring finger. Those things are important, and some people don't wear any rings at all. So it is very interesting to see. And so I think the time that we're in right now, especially also with the movement now to uh, include binaries, it is a perfect time to really be honest about the fact, as Robert said, that we all have prejudices. I would sometimes say I'm probably at times more prejudiced against women because of my experiences of being backstabbed a lot by women in the competition. While most men have helped me, don't get me wrong, some also try to take advantage. So I think looking at it as individuals 
And I remember saying, bringing this up partially last time as well as, let's just find new language. Because historically speaking, women used to be in charge, especially in countries that we nowadays call behind. India had a female leader before other countries. The United States still doesn't have one, just as two opposites. We used to have female queens, pharaohs, etc. That changed at a specific time in history, and we've just sort of gone along with that. So now we have four men here, and I know there are other men that Ed has brought in that we all have brought into our lives that feel the same way. So to me, what is important, and maybe that's why I'm considered a rule breaker, to use new language. It's about the language. Femi femicide, for example, didn't used to exist. So great, now we have femicide. There are words that we can use or rephrase and, and, and redesign to really describe what we want. Patriarchy, matriarchy, I don't know, maybe that is really no longer sufficient because in ancient times, those people who were everything, male, female, left, right, and center, they were regarded more as gods and the wise ones. So I think if we look at history, but create new words to define what we're saying, we can make a lot more progress. And on the analytical side, I'm very interested in what uh, General Secretary Guterres said, and when I discussed it with a number of people, I'd love to know where he gets that number from. Because 300 is a very specific number. So I'd like to know what exactly the data analysis for that is. And you know how it is. Once we set a goal post, we all go, okay, 300 years. Okay, go for 300 years. Well, I think that is reversing where we're going. Those are just some quick thoughts. So thank you, Ed. Um, and I think, you know, in, in companies, it's also important, like, uh, like everybody was saying, to listen to everybody. Sometimes the janitor knows more than the CEO, whether male or female, masculine or feminine. So I, I think it, it really um, is kind of important for us to just maybe switch the angle a little bit, if so that helps. Critical. What do you think, Tuniki? I just asked Natalie a question, so maybe she wants to answer that first. So what was the specific time in history when things pivoted away from women being, uh, being in, in charge and ruling? Uh, well, it has to do with religion. Can I leave exactly. it as, as blanket I, as I that? I thought so. <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to put it in the chat because then it was black yeah. and white, but I wanted to hear yeah. you say it. That's exactly yeah. my opinion too. But I and, and it is because, you know, if, if you think about it, um, we always need frameworks. You yeah. know, society and a lot of people would like a framework. It, 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 it takes off some of the pressures of having to make decisions if somebody helps you. And religions, I'm saying the big issue of religion. There are many religions that also have women in charge, um, but they tend to be smaller. So those world religions we have to really look at, I think, if that helps. Yeah, we're definitely into cross-cultural stuff, right, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You I want to welcome to the show Adriana. When you're ready, Adriana, we welcome you. Hi there. Hello. How are you, everyone? Good. I'm here Hola. in Mexico City. So yeah, good to so, hear all of you. Yeah. Well, welcome. Um, I know with the time change, uh, it, you know, people are getting all screwed up, not just here and there, but in London also. <laughs> according to the news today. So this is Adriana Fuentes. Uh, she's been on our program in the past. She's an author of what, four books? Four books, yeah. Yeah, and, and you're also, uh, you, you have a marketing public relations business, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, exactly, I'm a Mexican writer and also I have more than 15 years in the corporate world in marketing, communication and public relations department. So. Yeah, it's like I want to just dedicate myself to write uh, books for, for women and inspire women to achieve their dreams and goals in life. But I'm still in the corporate world and many, many, many challenges in Mexico and Latin America talking about that. Unfortunately. Well, 
Right, that's cultural, isn't it? It's historic. Yeah, it is, definitely. But it's so sad that, you know, in 2023, we women, we just need to face still, you know, many, many things. So, yeah. Okay, I want to uh, ask you to hold up uh, one of your book covers if you have it handy. And this is a public relations program and networking. So when you get around to it, show us one of your book covers or, or all of them. Oh, okay, <laughs> just two minutes and yeah, and I'll, and I'll go in and, and look for them. Um, yeah, I mean, as you know, um, Ed, all the, the books, uh, they're writing for women and inspired. By, by women and the first book name is when strong women speak strong women listen the second strong woman have beliefs and values the third book strong women uh, speak about leadership successful and leader and living well and the fourth book that i just have it right now in spanish is strong women speak about sex and it's the same thing in our latin american culture it's so sad that women, we can speak about sex. So this is like the fourth book. It's been very successful in, in, in Mexico and Latin America. And now I'm writing my fifth book. So bit by bit. That's so interesting. Dr. Lynn Schmidt, meet Adriana. Hi, Adriana. Yeah, we've talked, we've talked before. Good to see you again. Um, I just want to put out there a couple of things I've heard people say uh, and questions people had. The report from the UN, this is not the first year that they've done this. So they've been measuring this for several years. And the 300 is made up of, of different metrics that they look at by country. Um, it is things like the politics, the women's health and well-being, education, those sorts of things. The report's available. Anyone can access the report. A lot of the um, news articles had a link to the report. Um, you can also find it on the UN site. So that, that's all there. And this is not the first. They've been doing this for a number of years. So they've got measures against. And it went up a little this year. Um, the number got larger. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, at least based upon my research, going back to Natalie, um, is my understanding is the first recorded written uh, example of sexism uh, was in Homer's Odyssey three years, 3,000 years ago. Uh, Penelope was told to go mind her business and do her women's work and not contribute to the male conversation. So on and off, it's been going on a long time. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, I think Yvonne and Robert both brought it up, was about racism and other aspects that connect with sexism, which is often referred to as intersectionality. And I talk about that as well in the book, but I look at the intersection of sexism and racism, because obviously a woman of color is impacted by sexism very differently because of the, the addition of racism than a white woman. Sexism and ageism, Sexism and ableism, women with disabilities are often far more impacted by sexism, especially when it comes to harassment and violence uh, than any other women. Um, if obviously, if you look at the pace, the pay gap, the pay gap gets larger as well for women of color. I believe it's indigenous women have the largest pay gap. And so just wanted to address that inter intersectionality and it does get more complicated, but that's very important to take a look at. And as you're looking at what's happening with a woman, I often say, well, first look at the aspects of sexism and then look at, is there another aspect, another bias that's playing a role in how she's being treated uh, and, and what you might be able to do or how you might be able to step up and help. So I just, I wanted to address those few issues I, were here, I was hearing. Thank you. Annette Dernick. Yeah, as to the question um, when it started, um, in my opinion, it uh, started, I have to admit, already in the Bible when Eve was said to be made of um, Adam's rib. And um, as far as I know, and maybe Natalie, you know better, um, there were in, in some um, Jewish, uh, on the, in the Jewish culture, they talk about, um, let's say, a first maybe wife or woman that Adam had, but she wasn't, let's say, as um, handsome or as nice as he wanted her to be. And so it was said that she was thrown out of paradise to live a life somewhere in, in, in the dark. And then Eve was kind of introduced, let's say, on stage. And um, Eve was 
the, the woman that um, this man wanted. But I also would love to to, to come back from um, or to, to step back a little bit from this um, men and women because for me it's a little bit um, black and white. Um, I think if we all accept that I have feminine and masculine parts of me and that we are all really wonderful and awesome human beings and that the most important thing is that we see each other in this kind of light and I know that it's um, really um, crucial or, or difficult what's, what's happening to women worldwide. I do not want to kind of close my eyes but I think if we really see each other as we are and as we are made in my opinion, we wouldn't need this discussion any longer, um, but we would kind of treat each other equally and um, kind of um, contribute everybody in his or her or whatever the, the sex is position um, to, to the big um, whole that um, all unites, uh, that unites us all on, on this planet. Yeah, Lisa. I'm sorry, it's taken so long to ask you to speak. <laughs> and I, will, I want you to give us your perspective of all this. Oh, me, you're talking to me, Ed. <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah, so um, to, just picking up on what Lynn was saying about the patriarchy fighting back. Um, are you all familiar with the protests that have been happening in Israel over the last few weeks. They've been escalating uh, because Benjamin Netanyahu wants to push forward reforms to the judiciary, um, which are going to uh, put or could threaten to put women's rights right back in Israel, which is quite unthinkable, really, because... Um, they had uh, you know, they've had women in politics, uh, women in the army, and um, I actually picked the brains of uh, one of my connections on LinkedIn in preparation for this today. He is a lawyer in Israel, um, and I asked him about it. Um, he said that the concern is that if the reform passes, the religious groups we talked about religion, of course, we touched on it anyway, uh, will then be able to pass laws that weaken the status of women and force segregation in public places and events. The fear is that women's rights will be the first to suffer um, if these go ahead. So um, I, was, uh, I was quite um, astounded by this when I learned about it. And have you seen the photo of the 800, 800 women who dressed in the robes of the handmaid's tale? Uh, to, in protest um, and actually Benjamin Netanyahu has been in the UK this week to meet our Prime Minister uh, Rishi Sunak and uh, there were women who dressed in those robes as well to, uh, to greet him in Downing Street and to, to protest against his visit. Um, so I just really wanted to raise awareness of that uh, and to say that to pick up again on what Lynn said about the patriarchy fighting back they are and I think the the challenge that we face is this programming of centuries that it is a systemic and um and that as much as we're trying to make progress and gain ground uh that power when um they you know the patriarchy come together is uh is quite phenomenal and we're seeing it um in nations and advanced nations all over the world now um as far as allyship is concerned uh yes i mean uh, uh, many people today have spoken up ab about people speaking up and challenging it um and i think that we have to encourage men to discourage the sharing of content on social media, in groups, on Facebook uh, and, and WhatsApp that are unfavorable towards women and send the wrong messages out. I am aware, and I've spoken out against it, 
uh, that some of my male friends, because sometimes they put it at me, and I think it is a microaggression, that uh, when something is sent to you that is derogatory towards women, it's see how you react towards it. And if you don't speak up and you don't say this is wrong, it's a test to see how much uh, they can get away with. And um, I find it disturbing that so much of this content is being shared amongst men. Uh, the cartoons that still portray women, uh, for example, as the nag, the nagging woman, um, the, the busty woman either is either up for it or she is um, stupid. Um, the, the, the blonde woman being vague and dizzy um, and as well, you know, women who are overweight, uh, being taken, you know, um, uh, being made fun of. And, uh, and this is being circulated. And, and I'm glad that some of it does get in front of me because it makes me aware that there is uh, a lot, that, that this culture still exists and is doing so much damage. And I think why it is so pernicious as well is that it is disguised as something that is benign. It's disguised as humor. It's disguised as entertainment. And when we do challenge it, um, we get ridiculed for not having a sense of humor, for being too serious. But we have to keep challenging it because it's a big part of the problem. And Elisa, that's an excellent uh, input. And, uh... I'm just basically astounded at what's going on in, in Tel Aviv. And um, I saw a news flash maybe an hour ago that uh, said that uh, Netanyahu was going to step back on his efforts. That's, yeah. that's <laughs> un surprising. Now, I'm not sticking up with the guy, you know, but. This is, uh, we're not going to get into the politics of Trump and all that, but it's too similar and too ugly. Sandra, you had your hand up. Yeah, so I was listening to Elisa, and she made me realize something that I've been telling a lot of people about the, let's be honest, there's a lot of hypocrisy in politics, because if there's anybody that needs to start with the change that we're looking, it needs to start from the top. And it's never done that way. We're always looking to the next one, the neighbor, who, what did the neighbor do to me? Did my neighbor take my, my job away from me? Or are immigrants taking our jobs from us? It's, it's just ridiculous. We're constantly pointing fingers at each other when we really should be starting from the top. And I speak about this hypocrisy because when I think about the Senate in the US, and I'm sorry, I'm not very well versed in other politics and other countries, but what I've seen from other countries is that women have you know, more voice than it is in the US. In the US right now, what I'm looking at is, oh, okay, wait a second. So you are saying that women should be at home and they should be working at home, but yet you have all of these women working in the Senate and in Congress and all this kind of stuff. And then you have your wife in important positions, holding positions and taking money and all this kind of stuff. And you're like, so how is how am I supposed to believe you that you're saying that women don't have rights, which is, you know, disturbing to think that women don't have rights when you, your wife, is holding a position, a very high position, you know, in government. So, like, I understand that these people are old people, but now the new generation is holding on to that just to use the divisiveness that we have as human beings. And I don't think it's no longer so much about gender, but it's about now ideas. And because I've heard the other day, watching the anniversary of the Waco uh, killings, I heard this woman, she was part of that, I don't know what you want to call it, sect or whatever. She was 
talking things that I just couldn't believe that were coming out of her mouth where she was saying that women should not be voting, women should be, you know, at home, we women were doing our women things. And I couldn't believe it. And so for me, I believe it needs to start with us women. If it is, if there's anything that we would like to see change, it needs to start from the top, like I said, from politics, where these women that are there in Congress, that despite of their party, they should be standing up for us, for ourselves, for, for, for our gender. And we're not doing that. We're just, we're throwing, you know what, at each other, just because you have a different political view. So I would like for people to see that sometimes speaking up, like I want to appreciate all the men that are here. Thank you very much for speaking up for women. And despite of you having your biases and, and your, uh, your ideas, you still do it because in somehow, some way, you are psychologically safe because you have been taught to speak up. And women usually don't because we've been taught that if we speak up, oh, you're just overdoing it. You're just, you know, you're just being reactive, you know? So I think we need to start also in that, in training women and helping women, females as coaches, to help women to speak up and find their voice regardless of the situation. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Well, this is really interesting. Let's let's go down the the guy list here. Gary Singer. <laughs> what do you think of all this? Well, I think there's just a tremendous amount of passion here. You know, when um, when Annalisa talked through some of the issues that are happening, I'm guilty when I get pleasure out of some jokes, out of some humor, and in fact, it it uh, probably makes the uh, the woman being the victim in this, that's wrong. You know, and when I get a team member, a colleague, a friend, a neighbor, one of my two daughters pointing it out, you know, it takes a, I've got a little sign here on my thing. Some people just need a high five in the face with a chair. You know, sometimes, sometimes we just need to be kicked in the groin to be reminded of that. I want to take a different aspect on this. Um, being fully present. Now, I think we all perhaps are the most rude with other people when we're not being fully present. Somebody's speaking, somebody might be at the front of the podium, somebody might be right next to you, but you're not paying attention at all. You're not fully present. You're not right there listening. And I feel that that might happen twice as much in terms of men not listening to women, but fully being present rather than thinking about what my response is going to be. So if, if I were thinking out loud about fully present and giving the speaker the full respect, hearing, understanding, trying to get their point, I mean, in the uncle story before that just talks and talks and talks, you know, shut the hell up, right? You know, I think that's probably appropriate, but uh, that's not... That's not given for men or women. We all know a lot of people that talk way too much and you'd like to just scream at them to uh, not do that. But I'd like to endorse the idea of being fully present and hearing what he or she is trying to say. Gary, say, uh, if you don't mind taking a look at what you do day in, day out. Would you repeat that? You're still having mic trouble here. <laughs> okay, how about now? Yeah, there we go. Swallow it. There we go. Yeah. All right. So speak up about what you do day to day, to day your job. Uh, I'm a headhunter. I do retained executive search. And so I have that client, usually a middle sized, might be private, might be public. You know, they're looking for talent. And a quick story about an example here recently, $2 billion privately held manufacturing global company and I've had the pleasure of doing work for them for nearly 25 years. I get an email from uh, the top person that runs the organization. And he said, look, I'd like you to talk with our CFO. He is gonna be retiring here in the next year or two. And we don't have somebody inside. We'd like you to go find somebody that would uh, do that. We did that. And actually the first person we presented 
And they said, look, it would be highly preferable if a woman were the person that would take that role. So he or she, we want a she to be the person that's going to replace that. And the first person presented accepted the offer, moved from the East Coast, is out here on the West Coast. And uh, if she doesn't screw it up in terms of her performance, she'll be the next CFO of this $2 billion company. So the clients they defined almost short and tall, almost skinny or not, uh, they almost describe in a lot of ways, including male, female, what they'd like in the position. So I just really am happy about that particular quick success story. Thank you, Robert. Sorry, just unmuting here. Um, interesting, uh, great story, uh, actually, Gary. I, I have a question, and then I'm going to comment, if I may. The question to you would be, based on what you were telling us, if you've got clients coming to you and saying, listen, we just want to replace our CFO, uh, is there a way in which you can talk to them about being open to having a woman as that CEO, for example, or CFO? Uh, how, how open do you find companies are to if they haven't thought about this themselves, you coming to them and saying, actually, you know, I know a number of good women that will be a good fit for that role. How, how does that conversation happen? Well, I think you talk about what they want to get done, what they want to achieve. And the good ones, they're going to have a diverse background in their senior management team, in their executive suite. And typically they'll say, look, we want the very best person for the job. You know, they pay us a lot of money to go fill that executive position. And if they have a strong preference, because they think that will make their company better. As you understand your customer and why does that customer buy your product or buy your services, the good companies are gonna want a diverse and varied background of their executive team. The good ones will. The arrogant yeah. ones, not so much. Yeah. The yeah. arrogant ones that say, look, <laughs> the good old boys are gonna keep doing this. Well, you know, go do your thing. I'd rather go work for a different kind of a company. Thank, thanks, Gary. It's really, really interesting. Um, sorry, the comment that I was going to make about um, this whole allyship thing is um, a quote that um, from Gloria Steinem and, and Dr. Lynn Schmidt was the person that circulated on LinkedIn, uh, I think yesterday about uh, Gloria Steinem's 89th birthday, right? And uh, it got me thinking about uh, Gloria Steinem and how brilliant she is. And I realized that she explained to me why I've been showing up as an ally to women in, uh, in the work that I do. And the fantastic quote from her is, once men realize that gender roles are a prison for them too, they become really valuable allies to women because they're not just helping somebody else, they're freeing themselves. And I realized that while, well, you know, kind of what I've been doing all these years is kind of freeing myself from those male stereotypes that I face. Uh, and so there's a real win-win here uh, for me to be an ally to women because it's not just like I said, helping them, it's actually helping myself uh, too. And so I've done a whole stream of work on this benefits to men from being allies. And I know it sounds kind of maybe a bit crazy, but actually there are a load of benefits for men as well. So if we can get those benefits across to men, uh, we can encourage them to be allies and be doing good things to support women, but also to free themselves as well. Yeah, I'd like to go to Michael Gates and then Tineke. Mute. Michael, you're on mute. Yeah, do you have a specific question, Ed? Or do you That's just, two uh, demerits on Michael, right, Ed? They, yes. That's two demerits on the, on the mute button. Yeah, okay. Michael, uh, it's cross-cultural. Everything's cross-cultural. Well, absolutely. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking as we're going along is, um, you know, listening and speaking. And, um, you know, of course, there tends to be some cultures and also if you think about gender that um, <clears throat> tend to speak and not listen as much. But the question is, to what extent are you aware of it? And I was working with a, a team recently, a mixed cultural team, and the leader of the team was French. And as well as getting people to do a self-assessment, we have a cultural self-assessment on the web um, where you 
decide to, you know, what your values and beliefs and communication style and behavior is. But then if I'm working with a team, I, um, I also get people to do a mini assessment on each of their colleagues, like a sort of 360, a cultural 360. And I was really struck by this particular team where the French guy was in charge. And when we looked at communication, he'd assessed himself as um, listening most of the time. So basically he came out, I listen most of the time. So when we looked at his team's view of him, all of them said he talks most of the time. And I think this, uh, you know, is, is extremely important. And when he asked them, you know, he said, I'm very surprised because I think I'm a very good listener. Why do you think I'm not a good listener? And he, they said, well, you know, when we're having an important meeting with you, you're often fiddling with your phone, texting, sending emails. And he said, well, I'm a very good multitasker. And they said, well, that's not the point. The point is that our perception is that you're not listening. And if we can sort of understand really how we're perceived by others and modify our behavior, I got him to commit to say, look, in future, um, you know, if someone's talking to you from the team, don't start texting or emailing. Um, are you going to commit to that? And, and he, he said, yes. I said, well, we've got another session in a month and I'll be asking the team if you manage to uh, <laughs> keep that up. So actually, self-awareness followed by changing your behavior and then getting others to report back did you really change your behavior i think are very important thank you michael tinicky um briefly uh yeah. the, the 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 aspects of masculine and femininity within all of us this comes into play here right well, yes, thank you for addressing that, Ed. I actually wanted to uh, contribute something to the conversation about my um, my expertise as the president of She Credit in my country. She Credit is a, is a credit union um, which helps women to find funding. And in one way, I find it disturbing that we need to create these kind of organizations that we need to have funds where women can find finance. And when I talk to male investors, or even when I talk, uh, do presentations in rooms, and the, the, the guy is like, a, oh, well, well, they don't want us. So, so they don't really like that they can't get funding. But then it says, yeah, but they do want our money. So it's, it's, it's it's not really the case, you know, women can invest too, but there's this, as, as soon as women clock together and try to arrange something which men neglect, then there's this this awkward situation where they feel left behind like hey why why are why can't we and i said you can go everywhere to get funding and you will get it so much easier than we many don't believe that it's so hard and so difficult for us. And I never knew. I started my first business when I was 25 and I didn't get funding off the bank and I had no idea why. And now I see, I was a beginner, I was young, I was 25, I started doing business international immediately. So it, it was way out of their comfort zone. And I've every time when it's on finance i'm always talking to a male opponent on the other side of the table there's never a woman oh the first one i had and i talk to a lot of people in finance at the moment in my country um and investors say yeah but you know women don't take themselves seriously and their businesses are so small and I really have to educate them. I have to educate them and say, listen, if you invest in a women-owned business, you'll guaranteed to have double the investment compared to if you would put it into a male uh, business uh, owner. They are not aware, but it's been researched. Um, they don't know that women are very risk avoidant. So they, the way a, women, a woman presents somehow it's not appealing or a po uh, to, to them because there's not a lot of risk. There's not a lot of challenge. It's not the same language. So their brain is not wired that way. And if they can, I, and when I come and educate them and, I, and I'm now going to uh, hopefully try and educate investors in Uganda about this as well, 
where it's even more patriarchal country than, than my country, uh, how, how it will impact if they start financing in women. Because women, it, it's, it, the first priority is never profit. The first priority is team, is people, is community, and is making impact. So when they start investing in women-owned businesses, a lot will change. So much more will change. So, so, so this is what I wanted to, to contribute, that I'm talking to so many high-placed men and they all have women, most of them have daughters, and they're just not aware that the differences that they notice at home apply in the workforce, apply in business as well. And I find that so unbelievable. <laughs> so that was my contribution. Thank you. Adriana? Just uh, about what Gary uh, says about women opportunities. Uh, I mean, some of the biggest challenges women facing in today's workplace in, in Mexico and Latin America is the uh, gender pay gap. It's so huge. So it's so sad that women, we try to you know, achieve balance between professional, personal, and family life. But sometimes we have to work more hours and men. Sometimes we have to have two jobs, you know, to make the same money than, than men. So it's kind of so sad. And I don't think it's going to change like in the next few years, maybe in the next decade. But yeah, it's, it's so sad. So this is one of the, the biggest challenge. I mean, there's many other ones, sexual harassment, uh, racial discrimination, but the gender pay gap is just so huge. And when I talk about how many women they go to college in Latin America, usually there is like 36% of women, they go to college and then graduate from college. And it's still like, why we go to college, you know, like some of, some of us, we have two careers or many, many years of experience. And now we have to face big, big gender pay gap. It's, it's so sad. I mean, we have to work on, on that, of course. But yeah, it just I just wanted to comment that for you to know that is one of the ch biggest challenges we have in Latin America. Well, I thank you for speaking up. Dr. Lynn Schmidt. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to come back to Annalisa's comments uh, because it, it, that is so critical. Um, what she talked about as far as the mark, microaggressions that we accept daily, you know, that, that we'll laugh at or we'll think it's commonplace or in a lot of ways, and I, I did a post on this and got a lot of feedback from other women, sexism has become normalized. It's become accepted. Um, you now hear people talk about racism. It's not where it should be at all, but people will use the word. They'll tell someone they're a racist. They'll talk about racism. You don't hear people being comfortable talking about sexism, either because it's normalized or they don't want to admit it or acknowledge it. Um, you rarely hear someone call someone a sexist. So coming back to microaggression, that's where it all starts. That, and when we, you said that, Annalisa, when we accept that, that's when someone says, I push that, that's acceptable behavior. Well, now I'm gonna discriminate or I'm gonna harass, depending on the type of person you're dealing with. And from there, it can go to violence. When that ex is accepted, which it often is, then it goes to violence. And I wanna give an example, and Annalisa and Robert, you may be familiar with this, but two years ago, a police officer in the UK in London uh, kidnapped a woman uh, as she was walking down the street using his uh, badge and everything to do that. And he raped her and he murdered her. And what was found out later is that he committed microaggressions against women, his colleagues and other women on the police force and, and his colleagues, his other male colleagues using WhatsApp and everything accepted that. So he's like, oh, well, that's okay. So then he went on to harass and actually several weeks before he killed that woman, he flashed several women at a McDonald's and other places. It was reported and nothing was done. So once again, it was accepted. And he's like, okay, now obviously you, there's a few other things going on that allow you to murder someone. But it's still, when men murder or rape women, it's not about sex. It's about power and control. And he found out that he could, he could be, use microaggression against women and it was okay. He could harass women and it was okay. And it proceeded on to violence and murder. 
And so you may not think those microaggressions are much and, and ignore the micro part because they really add up to people. They're like little paper cuts. The more you get, the more impact it has. And if we don't stop it there, that's when it, it, the cycle progresses. People think it's okay and they move forward. And it starts young. That's the other thing I wanna add into this is they say by age two, children are picking up on their parents or friends or families um, biases. And they're aware and they start to have them themselves. And that's why we're all, we all have biases. It's from our family, our friends as children, our peers once we head into school. And it's from media. I mean, just look at the headlines. It's not a man raped a woman. It's a woman got drunk in a bar and got raped. Her fault. It's like, let's send all these women to leadership training because they're not doing things right. Let's not deal with the systemic issues that are really impacting the fact that they can't get, they're not hired for a job, those sorts of things. And so, and, and Disney, I, I, you know, they're getting better, but, you know, the little mermaid was told to keep her mouth shut if she wanted to get a husband. So we start educating our children at very young ages to be sexist, to be biased in many ways. Um, you know, if you allow someone to tell your grandson or your child that they, you know, boy, that he throws like a girl and you don't stop that, that's a microaggression. So I just, I mean, what Annalisa said was just so, so impactful and so important that we realize if we don't stop those, if men don't step up and if women don't step up and stop those and as early as possible, they can progress and move on to domestic violence, to sexual harassment, to all sorts of things. So thanks thanks for those comments. This is pretty scary. Whew. So Yvonne, you had your hand up. Yvonne, did you want to speak? No, well, I think there's a frozen issue here. Yes, I did. Oh, good. Yes, I did want to <laughs> no, there's uh, some interference, my, Yvonne. I cannot understand. Questions, and, but you see, this is very curious. Okay, the two examples. Oh, okay, Yvonne, uh, come on back when you can. Back, I'm back. Okay. I thought I, I thought in, even the internet's against me. Uh, internet is against me, but I was going to say, you know, my uh, aggressiveness, this whole thing, when a woman says something, it's aggressive. I never forget my colleague coming in to me. He was very frustrated with uh, uh, one of us, and he told me what he said to her. And after he finished, I said, did you say exactly what you said to me, to her? face and he said, sure that's exactly uh, that's exactly what i did and i thought and i said and i said what did you say and he said she kept quiet and i thought hmm so she kept quiet if i had said that i would have been this aggressive woman but because he said it she didn't respond and now i i, I think that you know it that is very curious i mean i'm not saying that women don't stand up for the because we were at a dinner party uh, many years ago, but I had the dinner party, and he asked me whether I was my husband's secretary because my husband is British, and in Asia, that's the typical stereotype, right? The 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 white guy with the Asian wife. And he asked me, so were you, were you a grand secretary? So I looked at him straight in the face and I said, well, I actually didn't know he was mine. And he never wanted to speak. <laughs> <laughs> he never wanted to speak to me all night again. But I mean, he did actually sit down and ask me. Was, yeah. what, 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 Ivan, unfortunately, there's a Sorry, I am problem. nobody's secretary. I yeah, mean... that, that's a funny story, oh. Ivan. Uh, but there seems to be a sound connection um, issue, but we got the gist of what you were saying, that's for sure. Robert Baker, do you have uh, solutions in mind? 
Well, Ed, I would just wanted to comment that I think, you know, it is unfortunately uh, so the situation that we're aware of, there are so many of these challenges um, for, for women in the workplace. And um, I mean, you asked us, I think, Dr. Lynn, to think about kind of solutions, things we could do, and just thinking about what men can do, for example. Certainly, I think, you know, kind of speaking up in those uh, situations where we see this bias and this um, these, these microaggressions happening. Um, and what, one thing was very interesting, actually, I, I was involved in a project to get men to actually put on VR headsets to experience a microaggression from the point of view of a woman, but actually then almost like experience it as a woman. It was kind of interesting just to see how they reacted to the, then, you know, to, 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 to that. So it, it's kind of what, what are the ways that we can engage, um, you know, men to start doing things differently? Uh, so maybe VR is a bit extreme, but, but there are other things that, that we can do. And I think a lot of it is around also how we uh, role model this to other men. Uh, so and that's one of the things I talk about with uh, with, with leaders. Um, and then just more broadly, uh, going back to this gender pay gap, I, I mean, you know, we should as, as, as men be campaigning to get that gender pay gap closed because uh, often it's, it's a result of, you know, uh, differences in representation at different levels. There are less women at the top where we've got the very big pay uh, checks. Uh, we need to get more women into those positions and that will help close the gender pay gap a bit. So the more that we can do, where we've got that opportunity as leaders to influence that um, and then campaign for flexible working, match parental leave, all these things that actually matter, I think, to men and women now these days and childcare support as well. So I think uh, I'd certainly like us to be talking about what can we be doing in our roles to actually change this, because otherwise we'll be talking about this for another 300 years. Well, we can talk for another 15, 20 minutes, but then I think we should end this thing. But uh, Adriana, would you like to comment? And really, I just wanted to, to share something uh, with all of you that happened to me like a few weeks ago. Uh, I went to Miami, Florida for a Women International Day. I, I have the opportunity to be a main speaker uh, to, to some community, uh, Latin American community. And at the end of my speech, uh, one lady, I don't know, from Ecuador, Chile, just came to me and told me, like, uh, thank you for your speech. It was very helpful for, for me because I just suffered a sexual abuse like a few days ago. And of course, when she told me that, I was like completely shocked. And my first question uh, was like, did you report her? And she told me, no, because was a politician. So it's incredible that, you know, women, Latin American women, we, we have to face that. And she told me something like, no, any lawyer from Latin America, any lawyer wants to support me or wants to work in the case. So this, you know, lady now, she doesn't know how, how to do or what to do because of course she's waiting for her resident papers in, in Florida. So it's because it's a politician, she can, you know, like report the case and report the abuse. So what about women's rights? It's, it's incredible that same thing. I mean, you know, in, in today's world, we have to, to face that. So it just, I just wanted to share with you because it's, it's like, it's incredible that we have to face that. And, and unfortunately, you know, we, we don't know what to do in general, so. Yeah, that's a major problem. Dr. Natalie, would you like to comment? I would love to, and I know that Annalisa is going to hit hard again in a minute. There were a number of things that came up that I find um, really, really important, uh, and I love the engagement. Thinking about tips, okay? Um, uh, first of all, Dr. Lynn, of course, she mentioned, you know, how do we pick up things? So really, um, I talk and most of my work is about unlocking the hidden power of patterns. We all have these patterns. And if we look at psychology, we've got Erickson, or we've got Kohlberg, we've got Piaget, and they all tell us the same thing. Kids take on whatever we show them. So that when we're now in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, these patterns are there. It's all in our subconscious mind, as we all have already agreed. So it's fantastic to see some of us in our, at our age saying, okay, I need to change that because change is really something that society has told us is weird or you know hard and so forth. 
I believe that it might even be more important, not just when it comes to changing the language, which I'm a big proponent of, obviously, but to also really look at where are we starting? Because we need to start at home. So yes, when, you know, Robert and Gary and Michael, for an example, I'm just picking the, the, the gentleman right now, and of course, Ed, you know, have daughters and they, they do it at home. Yes, that is crucial that dad also does the dishes or, you know, whatever. And there are many cultures in which that is happening where men at home are exemplifying. And we can't even say that it's all just now because you know whether you're from Idaho or Timbuktu, it depends on the family that you're raised in. And in most family, again, going back to history, women have done a whole lot. And so when now they're shared work, then the kids see, oh, look, mama does the finances. Maybe I can do the finances it always comes back around what we show at home. They bring that to school. And then fortunately or unfortunately in some cultures, we need to counteract what they're being taught in school. Because if there's only one uh, persistent opinion in the school, then there's another problem. So we need to talk with our children when they come home, well, what did you learn today? How did that work? And how are you being treated? Okay, so all the boys are being called in math, why not you? So there is, I think, as, as adults, whether we do have biological kids or not, it's really important to take that active role and engage with the youth because they are going to carry the weight. And the other thing that I wanted to briefly mention is when, when Tinika was talking about the finances, I have a very dear friend of mine and she changed the way things are being done. It's almost under the radar, but she is a very accomplished woman with lots of awards. It's now her third global company. And she has raised a lot of money, absolutely. And yet she still runs into issues when talking about, would you like to invest? She's extremely beautiful, I have to say that. I mean, I don't know how she does it, but she just like walks into a room. She has that charisma and everything. And even now, in meetings where she's asking for investors, she's got the pitch deck and everything. She has run into situations where the guy are saying, well, I really don't wanna give you money, but will you sleep with me? Or would you like to have a threesome? So now what she had to do, because in some cultures, she actually brought her husband in <laughs> as, a, as a co CEO, so to speak, to have those conversations, not because she couldn't handle it, but because she got sick and tired of it. And when I say she changed things in financing, for example, you know, thinking about uh, Tinnika's idea about finances again, because very often we hear that women can't do finances. Well, she actually opened up investments at $10 and she encouraged especially women from all across the globe to invest in her company at $10 or more so that they could realize I own parts of a global company. And that of course changed the whole financial situation as well. So when we're talking about how do we make, how do we reverse this or how do we move forward towards where we think we want to be? Think about home and think about how we can, you know, I always talk about revolutionize. How can we revolutionize the game? use and do it differently, even if initially under the radar, because that's when we bring people in and that's how movements evolve. So those two comments. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Annette, I haven't been ignoring you. <laughs> please, please comment, Annette. Oh no, everything's fine with me. I'm, I'm just listening and um... Um, as to tips, um, I, I think, uh, in my opinion, um, where it really starts is that I am kind of um, in peace with myself. Because when I'm in peace with myself, then I don't judge others this much. And um, I also agree um, with, with you, Natalie, and with many things that I've heard that it's so important to already start 
it it everything starts with me so that i become aware of my thoughts um of the, the situation when i'm judging and i yes i have to admit i'm judging as well and then i when i realize it i i, I tell myself oh annette stop it i really don't want to do it so i i, I try myself um and i i think it's um let's say a, a work that always um continues and um, if I can then be a role model, not only to my children, but also to other children and also to other people that I meet, in my opinion, that's the most important thing that we can all do. And I also agree um, that um, it all, it's also important to start at the highest possible level. So that's the reason why I love to address company leaders because um, it's always e easier to change it from top to the bottom. At the bottom, I also have the possibility and the chance to do something. So it's not that I'm kind of powerless, but for an organization, it's really much easier um, if the, the, the bosses um, start with it. I'm not talking about politics at um, present because um, that's still another subject for me. Um, and why I don't talk about politics is, um, uh, I have the impression that they have different rules. Um, and But nevertheless, in my opinion, it's always important that I speak up, that I try to change what I can do. And I always say that it's it, everything starts over here. That's the only thing that I can really change now. And um, that's why I really love to encourage everybody who wants to be encouraged to be his or her own genuine self and um yes to, to look to to try what i can do in in my um special surroundings so that's really my my let's say my my biggest tip what 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 we all can do and then to um yes so that everybody of us will contribute his or her and i'm not um, to, um, i want to include include everybody who is neither his nor her so i want to include everybody um so that we can really um contribute to a better world and a better place no peace and love that's great when take it from here Um, so, I mean, I want to thank everyone for joining, and there's been some great tips and suggestions and, and good discussion about what the issues are, which, which is just so critical, because the women I'm encountering, they're wanting honesty, they're wanting the truth, they're not wanting us to give them the world through rose-colored glasses and say, oh, wow, we have one more CEO this year than we did last year, while well, that, you know, there, there's just so many things, so they want to hear the truth. They want to know what they're up against and they want tips and solutions, which, you know, and, and men as well. I mean, as Robert said, as all the men on the call are, I mean, men, there are a lot of men that are very supportive and they're wanting to know what's, you know, what's the best thing to do as well. What are the tips? What are the solutions? What are the, what's, how can we address this? So I just want to thank everyone on the call. It's been an excellent discussion. Thank you. Michael Gates. Yeah, uh, thanks. A fantastic discussion. I, I just had one more practical um, point that I wanted to make. And, um, you know, my, my field is culture. And there are some cultures which certainly um, in those cultures, women have a much harder time. And, we, we, you know, we all know examples, you know, looks at what's going on in, in Iran at the moment. And, um, <clears throat> you know, that UN report um, is going to take 300 years. Well, things do take time and some cultures it really um is they're not cultures which are going to change overnight but i had a very interesting uh, instance which is going on at the moment that um about a year ago i had a young pakistani guy on one of my um uh, webinars and um afterwards he contacted me and said i wonder if you could help me because um my um my sister <clears throat> Uh, trained at medical school and then when she left she was a doctor for a couple of years and then she got married and the uh, the new spouse said and his parents said you know you've got to stay at home now you can't go out you can't work as a doctor you've got to look after the family 
and she was very upset and he thought is there a way that we can sort of help women in her position because there are a lot in Pakistan also in India and so he's designed this app which connects female doctors who are confined to the house with patients in a very direct way so that they can actually do the medical consulting from home and um, be connected with you know lots of uh, lots of patients so i thought that's quite an interesting way around you know it's it's one of these small steps but it certainly um, is very helpful in those situations where you're not going to be able to change the culture overnight and and stop families preventing women from going to work um but it's a really a, a really practical sort of solution so i i've we're working on this at the moment. In fact, I've got another meeting at five in the morning uh, with the investor, and it looks as though it's going ahead. Um, uh, interestingly, the investor is from India. Uh, but uh, So it's quite interesting culturally seeing an Indian and a Pakistani working together uh, in harmony. Yeah, it's not always so, the case. Thank you, Michael. Uh, this is really timely. Uh, Annalisa, are you working on an app? Am I working on an app? Yeah. I mean, we're talking about money and we're talking about ideas and, you know, connecting people and we all need money. Oh, yeah, we do. <laughs> we do. I'm always working on something. <laughs> That's for sure. But I just wanted to uh, just very quickly just put forward uh, another idea for a solution. We talked about uh, the difference between um, saying you're an ally and being an ally and, uh, and the number of people who actually speak up as opposed to um, say that they support, whether it's women or whether it's uh, black women or disabled people, whoever it happens to be. Um, and I just think we can start where we're at because sometimes we try to think at a, you know, at, at a big level and it almost paralyzes us because we think, well, where do I start with this? But if we start at home, if we start within our circles, our friendship circles, uh, in our communities, in our, the groups that we're connected with. And we start having this conversation as to why don't we speak up? Why don't we speak up when we see that something is wrong? Obviously, it comes down to fear. The reason why we don't pipe up is because we're afraid. We're afraid of some kind of reprisal. We're afraid of some kind of attack. We're afraid of it negatively impacting us on some way. And so we stay silent. And who knows, had those, you know, the, the, the police in that WhatsApp group uh, spoken up, said this is wrong sooner, then that woman might still be alive. So I think we need to, to take responsibility and to be accountable, each of us, uh, for, uh, for having these conversations and saying, hey, you know, do we, do we speak up? Why don't we speak up? And how can we support each other in doing that? And we can have that, you know, we, we can do that straight away. Fascinating. Uh, Adriana, thanks very much for your time here today. Uh, would, would you like to talk uh, about uh, your next venture? I mean, first, yeah, I, I'm, I'm agree uh, what uh, the, the lady just told about take responsibility. Supporting each other is so important, I think women, we, we need to really support each other. Uh, it, it's so important. Raise our voice, talk about our needs. Uh, of course, try to achieve a balance between professional, personal, and family life, and just keep keep working. It's not something that is going to change, you know, as soon or very fast, but yeah, we have to really uh, uh, work for our, our rights. So, and my next book is going to be about exactly balance between professional, personal, and family life because I think it's so important just not to to talk about and, and to yeah to talk or to to invest uh, our time in in just family and professional life. It's it's also important about our personal needs. So yeah, I hope I can tell you more about it <laughs> in the next few weeks. But yeah, it's. It's been a pleasure to be here and to hear a different point of view about many, many uh, subjects that, you know, women we face. So thank you for the opportunity and I would like to connect with all of you.
Yeah, feel free. Uh, don't forget, use that chat and pass your uh, website or LinkedIn address or whatever. Gary Sanger, thanks so much for your valuable time. Uh, this has been uh, 100 minutes almost that I've had you. This is, I think, the longest time. <laughs> so thank this, you. This is a pleasure. I, I'm yeah. struck with a comment that says, do what you can do where you can make a difference. One of the ladies that just spoke it, we get paralyzed when we think of the world. We think of the company or the country or the, the planet or whatever. Let's think about what our next little pay it forward idea might be. You know, how can we simply be nice? You know, this, uh, if it's too big, it's too daunting. And I don't know that we get much done. Pleasure to be here, Ed. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to uh, be included. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Baker. Uh, tell us about your investments in these two, um, I guess, global startups, right? Well, um, thank you, uh, Ed. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the gender pay gap uh, company is uh, more focused on the UK because of the UK legislation around gender pay gap. So it's about actually UK companies uh, calculating their gender pay gap correctly and, and getting the right representation of women in the organization. But similar ideas are coming in other countries as well. So we'll see uh, that I think being increasingly a global uh, picture. Um, the, uh, the other company I mentioned that I'm um, uh, on the board of is uh, this talent development company, which uses a, a platform um, driven by AI to help organizations um, uh, help their leaders, if you like, develop the experiences that they need in order to, you know, uh, to get to the next level in the organization. So it's used for succession planning uh, quite a lot. Um, I, I think the other thing is this uh, InPeak web free platform uh, company I was talking about, run by an amazing lady called Somi Arian. I mean, talk about a, a woman who's determined to see change. Uh, basically, she's gone into a very male dominated arena and uh, put together a company uh, which is uh, trying to make sure that women uh, participate in, you know, blockchain and, you know, Web3 and all of these technologies which are going to make a major difference to our lives. Um, and, you know, I'm just supporting her because I think it's the right thing for me to do. Um, and, uh, and, and I think she's got a good story and a, a good opportunity. Um, and I, going back to this point about, you know, how, how we as men can show up, I've spent quite a bit of time and money over the years supporting women run businesses why not because you know i think that's a, one way of leveling up the gender pay gap is if i use some of my money to redistribute uh in women run causes and, and i've done that um you know over time so uh um i think other men have a duty to show up in that space too so that's one of the things i talk about when i talk to to other guys uh as well uh, we really have got to use our privilege and our power uh and be true allies in that sense by by you know we're and and and, and using our pocketbooks you know to to really um uh, put our money literally where our mouth is. So um, I'm aiming to do my bit on that and I expect others to do the same. I welcome you to come to our London meeting, uh, May 9, and on this topic. Uh, and I'll have more news about that event later. Sandra okay. Corona, thank you very much for staying up late. Uh, getting to be, you know, oh, it's still early there, right? What time is it? Then? It's 7.44 p.m. Okay, so it's 10 hours. Yeah. Okay. Yes, hours. with the time change, if, yeah, it's it's been a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Oh, well, thank you. It, it was amazing. Thank you very much. Great, great. Uh, so I will send each of you uh, the program link when, it, when it's finished. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll send you both uh, the gallery, which is what we're looking at now an inch tall. And then I'll send this Hollywood close up version too, uh, which, uh, you know, the camera never lies. So you may not want to, it's up to you <laughs> what, which one you want to use. <laughs> so I thank you for being on Global TV Talk Show. It's really been a learning for me, and I'm sure for uh, other guys in the audience. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Yeah. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Thank you much. everyone. Thank you, Ed. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, Bye. Ed. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everybody. I, I, Thanks, Liz. I, Thank you. Thank I you, think Liz. the show Thank will you. reach a million viewers over the next <laughs> <one>. <laughs>